Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This piece was supported in part through an unrestricted educational grant from Acacia Pharma Incorporated. In it, we're going to be tackling the subject of post-operative nausea and vomiting. How do practitioners who have an emphasis upon value-based care incorporate dealing with one of the less pleasant realities of surgery for a patient? The story starts back in 2019 with a conversation we had with TJ Gann, professor and chairman at Stony Brook in New York. This conversation was conducted at the European Society of Anesthesiology. Since this conversation took place, the drug being discussed has been approved. So recently we um, had a regroup yes. of a group of experts in uh, post-op nausea and vomiting and had an update on the consensus guidelines. And a meeting we just had a few weeks ago, and so now we are in the middle of the putting the information together. And there are some new um, strategies, management strategies, and also there is a, a new drug. Uh, on the um, post-operative nausea and vomiting front. Okay. That, how does it work? Where is it? Yeah, tell so us more about it. the new drug is called amusalpride. Now, amusalpride is an interesting drug because it's a dopamine antagonist. Right. Now, we are familiar with droperidol, which yes. is a dopamine antagonist. Now, droperidol was a... Uh, very popular antiemetics yep. uh, until when the FDA put a black box warning back in 2001. And uh, because of the concern about QT prolongation and torsat de pont. To so heart, to heart, heart dangerous heart rhythm. Correct. And so as a result of that, the use of droperidol literally dropped to almost nothing. Yeah. And then since then, you know, we couldn't get droperidol in most of the parts of the U.S., and so uh, this drug is actually working through the same mechanism. It's a dopamine D2, D3 antagonist. So it does have a very similar efficacy, like a droperidol, but the advantage is that in the clinical dose that we use, uh, it doesn't really have any increased risk in QT prolongation. So it is a bit similar to having giving droperidol without concerned about the QT prolongation. And if I mean, any other novel strategies outside of the box thinking on PONV? Any other? Yes, I think the other thing is that I th- we all know that combination antimedics work better than the single agent. But interestingly, recent surveys shown that many of our patients still do not get optimal um, combination therapy. As a result, the incidence of PONV is still unusually high and really should not be as high as what we see today. In this series, we speak in detail with Drew Riddle, Associate Professor of Professional Practice in the School of Nurse Anesthesia at Texas Christian University, Associate Professor of Medical Education at TCU School of Medicine and Director of the Centre for Translational Research, a JBI Centre of Excellence in Cochrane US TCU Centre. Here's a clip of him speaking about Amisil Pride as a rescue agent. Yeah, I mean, you've had experience now of, of right. using this compound as a rescue antiemetic. Is that correct? That, yeah, that, absolutely. And, and really, that's where it is in the U.S. context, at least. It is indicated, Amisil Pride is indicated both for prevention and for rescue. And um, in my clinical practice, um, we, we do get, I can get to close to a seven, 70-ish percent efficacy with you know, reasonably well uh, documented, high safety profile, quite frankly, reasonably inexpensive drugs. And mm-hmm. so it's that 30% or so of the patients that exa- that look exactly like that. And when we think what that looks like clinically and why, Desiree, to your initial question of do, do anesthesia providers, do anesthesiologists and CRNAs and the like realize or believe, if you will, Mm -hmm. that their patients have nausea and vomiting in a very fast turnover in in which we've all been, you you drop them off. And in the two and a half minutes of handover from you to the, to the receiving nurse and the post-operative care unit, um, well, they didn't have nausea or vomiting then, so they must not have it. Um, We know that the data suggests, and, and we see this as we follow on, on, our patients as they go down the, uh, the continuum, that it's in that first two hour mark that the nausea and vomiting tends to peak. Mm-hmm. 
And so while it may not be in the first two and a half minutes in that first two to two to four hours is when we, we tend to see it the highest. And then there's another sort of peak beyond that, especially on those patients that go home. Once they're out of the hospital, um, you know, they're sitting in the car driving, well, hopefully they're not driving, riding in the car, going down the road, um, that, that some, that some of that nausea and vomiting related to motion sickness to the vestibular system that gets activated. And then we see yet another peak of, of post-op nausea and vomiting. And so it's happening. Um, and we, we really up until today or, or recently with the release of MSL pride, we've had no really good evidence-based treatments. And so, you know, comparing that to ERAS and, and enhanced recovery, Monty, I know that's been a, a mainstay of your career for, for quite some time. Um, we have phenomenal ERAS recommendations, guidelines, protocolized a lot of the care up until we get to the post-op nausea and vomiting piece. And then it's mm-hmm. sort of like, as we describe it in Texas, it's like the wild west. Who's giving what? It's a free for all because we don't really have good efficacious drugs. So we just sort of give a little bit of a lot of things and and cross our fingers and hope it works. The fuller conversation is available via a link in the show notes. You'll also find a link to a discussion with Rick Dutton, Chief Quality Officer for U.S. Anesthesia Partners Texas, about the effective minimization of PONV or post-operative nausea and vomiting. Here's a taster of what to expect, where he explains how we can track the value proposition of a novel therapy. Sure, there's literature, and TJ developed some of it, around you know, what a patient with POMV costs you. And it's PACU time, you know, length of stay in the PACU, and everybody's PACU is instructed at four o'clock in the afternoon. So getting that patient out is important. It's important for patient flow. It's hugely important for patient satisfaction. And you know from our prior talk, USAP measures patient satisfaction quite closely. We follow this. We work on it continually. So we have data about this, and we know that PONV is a major dissatisfier. Uh, So it's something we want to work on. And so we can turn that into dollars. And part of my discussion with the P&T committee, you know, the first line is, we want to have access to try this. And then that's always followed by reassurance. We're happy to work with you to not break the bank. Right. We don't want to give it to anybody. We'll give it in specific indications. We'll write guidelines for that. You know, we'll follow them, but we need access to it to find out if it helps. And then the third argument in this case was, you know, here's the value proposition. Here's what effective treatment of PONV in the PACU means to the patient. Here's what the drug costs. You know, here's what we get out of it. And I work in Dallas. I work clinically in the OR at Baylor University Medical Center, which is the flagship for Baylor Scott and White which is a giant healthcare system, I don't know, 50 hospitals in North Texas and a gazillion surgery centers and clinics and what all. I mean, it's, it's a colossus. And they have all of the ablative armor of every other health system to ward off expensive new stuff. So they have a very sophisticated system-wide P&T committee. But my job is to go tackle that. And here was an example. And as a Baylor physician, I can wade right in. So we took it to the P&T committee and we took it right to the top. I called the pharmacist who chairs that and we had a chat and he made the mistake of telling me what we needed to do to get it approved. And then we did it. They looked at all the literature. They had some pharmacy intern write the you know four page summary of literature on this. They came back and they They refused it the first time, but there was enough wiggle room in there that we were able to go back, give them a very specific algorithm, say, you know, we're going to, it boiled down to, we'll use this five or six times a month, that instead we would be prescribing EMEN and K1 inhibitor, Mm -hmm. right? Because we had clear literature that says giving another dose of of ondansetron isn't going to help, but was what most people were doing. And we pulled all that data and showed, here's what's being done. It's ineffective. It's proven ineffective. Here's what should be done. All the alternatives are expensive or dangerous. In the case of uh, promethazine was the other one that mm-hmm. had a conversation at that point, but it's sedating, it prolongs stay, it's contraindicated in some patients. And the pharmacy knew all that because they published all that themselves. So we were able to go back and say, you know, compared to uh, the other alternatives, this is a reasonable one with a reasonable value proposition. We gave them a very specific flow chart, this, then this, then this, and they bought it. And so we get access to it. 
at the institution. And it's been three or four months now. We have given it, you know, maybe eight or 10 times a month in talking to the folks who have, including myself. It works. It's helped. So this is a success. And my goal in this was not to sell a million units for Acacia. My goal was to give my clinicians access to a new medication that could be helpful. Do you have to, because these are reasonably familiar processes in the National Health Service, and there's always a suggestion that they're going to follow through and make sure that you delivered the value proposition. Do you have to close out on that? Is there a follow-up report? Or if there's enough kind of, look, we're sensible practitioners. If we do it and it works when we do it, we want to keep doing it. And if we're not breaking the bank, we're not breaking the bank. It was not overt in the process, but it was strongly implied. The hospital pharmacy is clearly looking at their budget. And if this line item sticks out, they will be back to talk to us. I have no doubt. So it wasn't, it didn't need to be said overtly because we know they're doing it. If you look at your podcatcher or on topmedtalk.com, you'll also notice a piece with Trisha Myers, PharmD adjunct professor, Texas A&M College of Medicine. Here she speaks about where this treatment fits in practice. A missile pride or bar as it's labeled in the U.S., uh, was used as an antipsychotic. Uh, it's a dopamine antagonist. And at a much lower dose, found that it can alleviate postoperative nausea and vomiting. Uh, the company decided to do most of the studies, even though they did prophylactic studies, they did studies also on treatment and found that it was very effective. And this is something that uh, we've always felt the dopamine antagonist for strong drugs. In fact, droperidol was probably the number one preferred drug by anesthesiologists for many years as a prophylaxis drug. Of course, it fell out of favor in the early 2000s because of the QT prolongation issue. And that's something that we look at very carefully now on the treatment drugs. Again, because anytime a patient suffers from a drug interaction, adverse event, or a side effect is causing that prolonged stay in the recovery room. And if we're discharging the patient to home, if it's a day surgery, we certainly don't want to have those lingering side effects with the drug. But even if the patient is staying in the hospital, we certainly want to make sure he's ready for discharge or she's ready for discharge as soon as possible. And so that's why it's important when you're selecting these drugs You not only look at what drugs you've given prophylactically to decide what you're going to give for treatment if the patient has nausea and vomiting after surgery, but you also pay attention to the side effects. As pharmacists, those are things that we look at on a daily basis. It's our our job to make sure when a patient receives the drug that it's the most optimal drug. And those things include looking at their renal function, their liver function. We look at their allergies, their contraindications, maybe their disease state. We also look at dosing adjustments. Is it going to be difficult for the nurse to have to to do a calculation? Because the more steps you add, the more opportunity there is for error. And we do monitor drug interactions. So when we go to P&T, we sort of look at what the ideal drug would be. And when we look at an antiemetic, the ideal drug is one that would be Uh, have proven efficiencies that would have a rapid onset, would have the duration that you would want, especially an antiemetic. If we're using it for an outpatient surgery, we'd like to have an antiemetic that has a longer duration because the patient then, once they leave the hospital, will have that coverage for PONB. We look for simplicity of dosing. We look for a low profile for drug interactions and contraindications. We look for a reasonable cost, but our primary emphasis is on a strong safety profile. The fuller conversation is available in the show notes to this podcast. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.